you give up all rights to your work. I've had extensive opportunity to discuss this with the University of Kansas's general counsel, and their interpretation is that it could even go so far as once you publish your paper, you can't even give a seminar on it because that is, in some sense, reproducing, performing, or displaying. And so this is something where academia has not paid attention to a very, very important dimension of our science communication. So it all distills down to who owns research. Maybe it's you because it's, it's your intellectual baby. Maybe it's your institution. Your institution probably paid for some of the research and certainly paid your salary. So maybe they have some right to the research. Maybe it's the funding agency because they paid for the research to be done. And then maybe we should think about the journal as well because they have the reputation, they have the impact, they do the marketing, they do the typesetting. We have to give them some credit as well. So I think each of the first three that I just listed for you do indeed have some basis for claiming ownership. And I'll even give you that the fourth, the journals, have some claim to ownership. But there's some problems in there. The journals are striving to keep exclusive rights. And the reason is, is that academia is the goose that lays golden eggs. Okay? Think about if your institution has access to Wiley Blackwell journals. Okay, it's only about 2,000 journals that they take care of. So if you have access to Wiley Blackwell journals, you're a customer. In some sense, your university is buying access to those journals every year. Now, if I go to the grocery store to buy tomatoes, and all of a sudden the grocery store raises the price and tomatoes, sorry, tomatoes, um, all of a sudden the price is double or triple, I'm going to go to a different grocery store, right? I have choice. I can vote with my, my dollars or my rands. Well, if, you, if your institution has access to Wiley Blackwell journals, and if Wiley Blackwell or any other publisher raises the price, do you really think that you and your colleagues can say, oh, okay, forget it. I don't need access to journal biogeography. Let's go to some other grocery store. It can't happen. We are the buyers who have no choice. Right? We are completely locked into always buying. Well, the University of Kansas pays four and a half million dollars every year for the journal access that we have. How many peer institutions are there across the U.S.? 300. 300. So 300 times 5, that's 1.5 billion dollars just from kind of mid-level and higher state universities in the United States. Walk around the world, go to the higher institutions, go to the less fortunate institutions, it's tens of billions of dollars and the publishers have been raising the price on our tomatoes 12% per year over the last 25 years. So KU pays for us, in my case, pays for the facilities for research, pays for writing, pays my salary, sometimes pays page charges, and then has to pay to access the research that it funded. Okay? Journals, of course, gain maximally if they have the exclusive rights. We are the goose that lays golden eggs for this industry that bought up academic publishing before academic publishing knew how valuable it was. So there's a big experiment going on called the open access movement 
where essentially universities around the world and funding agencies around the world have been asserting certain levels of rights to our intellectual products. I'm not going to go into details on the, on the mechanisms and talk with you about that afterwards. But in essence, if I sit down and write a paper during this course, I have in advance, beforehand, granted a license to KU to serve a copy of that paper before I even publish it. And that license is mine to give because I haven't given up the copyright. It's a big experiment. It's got legal, legal implications, but it's really interesting. Since we started that, we've literally seen 1.2 million more downloads of items in our institutional repository since we passed our open access policy. It makes a huge difference to assert that academic scholarship is open to the world. Um, we get usership at that level. That's just for my department. We have 126 countries reading the scientific output of these 40-some professors at the University of Kansas. So it does make a huge difference. So again, a conclusion, it's pretty much the same as the last one. Access to the scientific literature translates into broader readership, more impact, and bigger constituencies for scientists. So let's talk about biodiversity data again. Um, I'm using this buzz phrase DAK, Digital Accessible Knowledge. A lot of data exist for a lot of taxa and a lot of regions of the world. Okay, there's tons of information out there. Manderley, you were talking about the data deluge or the non-deluge. So that huge amount of data exists but much of those data are in non-digital formats. They're in non-shared digital formats or poorly developed shared digital formats, which is to say they're not accessible. Um, so my assertion, and this is designed to um, provoke argument, provoke debate, but my assertion is that if data are not digital and accessible in the best of formats, they don't exist. Translation of that statement is, I'm tired of people saying, how can you set out to do this and this if I've got those data sitting in my lab? Those data don't exist. If they're not digital and if they're not accessible, they don't exist. So that's the, the idea behind the concept of DAK. And the tree falls in a forest in Russia. Precisely. Doesn't make a noise. Precisely. If nobody's there to hear it. Or if I can't in South Africa hear it. <coughs> right? So let's think about documenting biodiversity. The first thing is we've only sampled a small part of biodiversity. Right? Nobody's gone to every place on Earth and looked at every taxon. Once biodiversity is sampled, there's clearly some data loss. Specimens get destroyed. Um, data records get destroyed. That certainly happens. The specimens have to be identified, determined, and hopefully by an authority. You know, especially in the, the entomological world or the, the soil biota world. There are tons and tons and tons of samples that aren't sorted. Or if they're sorted, they're not identified. So that's, a, that's one big impediment. They need to be digitized. The order of these things doesn't really matter. It's, it's the idea. But the data need to be digitized. And then the digitization process needs to be supervised for quality. Essentially, you need to go through a whole suite of steps designed to detect, flag, and to the extent possible, eliminate and correct the errors. This is a place where CREA 
uh, has been has been a, a, a massive leader. Um, another important step is georeferencing. Okay, we like to look at maps. Our Sanbi examples were loaded with maps. If you don't georeference the biodiversity data, you can't see them spatially. And then, remember it's accessible, so the data need to be published, and they need to be published under the, the most current and most um, appropriate of standards, which is to say you can put them out there in the form of you know, PDF documents on the web, huge data sets, but they can't be integrated easily with other data, they can't be accessed easily. So we've got, we've got standards that allow us to do this better than just throwing up text files. And finally, we make our data um, available and integrated with other such data. So now let's think about the leaks in this process. Clearly, we go from this phenomenon that is biodiversity. We're trying to characterize it. And the only data that are digital accessible are the ones that get through all this process. Clearly, we've got some work to do as far as sampling biodiversity. There are places on Earth, and there are taxa in particular places on Earth that haven't been sampled, haven't been sampled adequately, and or haven't been sampled recently. Okay, but really what we've got is a whole set of leaks. We're going to come back to this phenomenon in a moment. But these are all leaks where potentially usable information, where somebody went out and did the sampling, it's leaking. Okay? And it, the only thing we're left with at the end is this little bit after all that leakage. So just to give you some examples, this is off of the GBIF site. Uh, birds, somewhere around 90 million records, digital and accessible. And you look and you say, wow, Australia, North America, Europe, doing pretty good. That's what South Africa, doing quite well. But look at a lot of Africa, and I see a lot of green, which is no information. Look at Asia. Look at Brazil. And so something's wrong, right? We're not, that's probably inarguably the best known taxon on Earth. That's the view we get. Let's go to a different taxon, plants. Same holes. Brazil's quite a bit better, right, Vanderlei? Yeah. Um, but the same holes in biggest um, view, same strengths around the world. Notice also we've got some things that are almost clearly problems, right? Somebody needs to do some data cleaning. But the data for Brazil is not yet GBIF. Ah, so it's going to get better. Is this GBIF? This is GBIF. So just to give you, itself, must, you must remember, has a bias. Without a doubt. To those countries who are involved in it. Without a doubt. Go to mammals, we see bigger gaps. Go to insects. Just go back to mammals for a minute. Mammals. Insects. Now, I do uh, a lot of work with mapping disease transmission risk. So let's look at mosquitoes. Notice now that huge chunks of the world have no information. Let's look at um, vectors of leishmaniasis. Much worse. Looks like looks like South Africa would be in the top three of the world as far as providing access to data. I know Brazil is, is coming in with big data sets too. But notice, whole continents where there is not a single data point. Oh yes, they do. They do have Oh yeah. 
Oh, yeah. It's not as if they don't have it, so they don't have the information. No. At least these regions have major problems. There's your worst case. You know, you want to look at pathogens. There's no information. And the few virus data that do exist digitally and accessibly, the few virus data are usually environmental sampling rather than things relevant to, to um, disease and public health. So my point is simply that when you sit down and look at your desktop and the GBIF site says 400 million records, you think, wow, right? Or you look at, at CREA's species link and you say, what, 8 million records? What, what is species link? 6 million. That's a lot. And yet, it's biased massively taxonomically, it's biased massively spatially, and it's biased massively temporally. And so when you sit down at your workstation to actually do the research, those leaks in digital accessible knowledge are fatal because we lose almost all of our data power. So this is a concept. Vanderlei and I have, a, have a, a biodiversity argument. He attributes uh, this phenomena to, phenomenon to crocodiles, and I actually attribute it to dragons. But the dragon is a great lover of art, especially gold and silver work. He loves to hoard jewels and treasures, amassing vast amounts of valuable antique metalwork. Although they haven't any real use for money and jewels, they collect heaps of gold and gems. Sorry about the personal pronouns. This is plagiarized off the web. He is very jealous of his belongings and guards the treasure he's built up over the years in large storerooms. He keeps detailed inventories of all his possessions. There's the catalog, right? So that he can be alerted immediately if a single object goes missing. Notice that our dragon isn't using those jewels for anything. So there we have biodiversity information and the dragon sitting on top of it. So let's go back to that information flow where we start with the phenomenon of biodiversity. Here's where our information is created, right? That's the sampling. Here's the little bit of information that we can actually use. And we can see this as a big negative, but we can also see it as a big positive. Each one of those arrows that I've circled is an opportunity. If you, for example, solve the challenges of georeferencing and make the process, let's say, a hundredfold more efficient, then you stop this leak. And the data that flow through to the end as usable information is much greater. If you perhaps create a means or a community that can do the determinations efficiently and broadly, then much more data, this goes to nothing, and much more data is flowing through this circuit. So this is both bad news and good news. The bad news is that we're currently losing a lot of information. And the good news is that you don't necessarily have to go out and do the field work. You know, obviously, we have tons of field work left to do. But you can make the status of digital accessible knowledge quite a bit better by plugging leaks. And that actually offers quite a bit of hope for upping the amount of information that exists in digital and accessible formats rather quickly and efficiently. So my purpose in this talk was just to throw out some ideas about what data and information really mean. As far as I'm concerned, my interpretation is that information access translates very directly 
into controlling your own destiny. I gave you the example of Mexican birds here and of the scientific literature here. I didn't talk about access to software. It's a very big challenge. Anybody who uses ArcGIS as a GIS platform knows that it costs about $10,000 a year to have a computer with ArcGIS on it. Um, textbooks are a huge problem, partly because if you've been a student any time recently, you know that, that a brand new, up to the, the moment, edition of a popular textbook usually costs between $100 and $150 right now. I also see a problem with it because it's a huge source of conflict of interest in academia. If you have arrived at a certain point in your career that you can write an authoritative textbook, and let's say all of the introductory biology courses around the country or around the world adopt that textbook, Every course that you know, has 100 students who use your textbook, that might mean $1,000 in your pocket. And I know of numerous examples where professors write a textbook and then require it as the textbook in their own classes. Mm. Conflict of interest. But also, it's an information access question. And then, quite, quite simply, learning access. Essentially, access to expertise, knowledge, and experience that allows any of us to do the analysis or to ask the questions that we really seek to, to ask and propose. So, um, knowledge is power, information is power. Um, and I think that folds into these questions about why is Sanbi serving data? Why are all of the nascent efforts around the table seeking to serve data? Okay, it's not just looking inward, it's also looking outward. But it makes a big difference to open up data and information, make them accessible in the most primary and fundamental of formats, which is to say primary research grade data being completely and efficiently and effectively open to the broader community. So just some food for thought. Um, any questions specifically about this material? <laughs>